Good afternoon, friends. I welcome you to the Lighthouse Hard Talk session where we will be taking on the topic of the unconventional opportunities beyond regular government jobs. I am very pleased to introduce our speaker for us this afternoon. He is none other than Mr. Yamfo Kikon. Yamfo Kikon is a qualified electronics engineer. He has had over 10 years experience working in the information and digital technology industry, having worked as senior software engineer in Accenture, where in the first end-to-end e-government -end e portal, including the online NPSC system, was developed. He then later worked as senior government advisory consultant with EY, Ernst & Young, for government of Uttarakhand and government of Goa to improve their ease of doing business, to develop the single window system for investors and the startup policy for Goa. He is currently deputed to government of Nagaland by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology as senior technology management consultant and attached to Kohima Smart City on additional assignment. As a business entrepreneur, Yamfo Kikon is also the co-owner of the first organized retail store in Nagaland, Westside in Dimapur. As a social entrepreneur, he founded the Naga blog, focusing on cyber activism and also the music platform Indie Hut to promote the talents in our region. We consider ourselves very fortunate uh, to have a man of its caliber to come and guide us through this much needed topic. We will be having a Q&A session right after the talk. So please do log in to Instagram, Lighthouse Live Chat later and do raise your questions. Thank you. I now give the rest of the time to our speaker. Hi, my name is Yam Fukikon. I'm an entrepreneur and a te technology consultant. Uh, I would like to thank the Lighthouse UBC for giving me this opportunity to just share a few experiences and whatever I have experienced in life with everyone watching. Uh, this is a great privilege for me. And I guess I haven't really prepared anything, but whatever comes to mind, I'm just gonna share randomly. Maybe a chronology of my life events starting from my childhood till today so that I guess some of you can relate to it. And my, my story, I hope that it motivates those whoever is watching and hope that it inspires you to think beyond just the conventional norms of uh, how we here, especially here in a society, we think that it, the only option left for us is government service. Beyond that, there's nothing much. But I think there's a whole world of opportunities for each and every one of us, especially the younger generation. Our generation, the older generation, we are from this, uh, this, this, this generation where we did not have many mentors who were outside the government sector. So we were kind of left on our own. We had no opportunities. We had to create our own opportunities. We had to go out and explore, become explorers. So with whatever we could go out and explore and learn and experience and bring it back to our society, I'm sure we can have many more explorers in our Naga society who will go out and bring some cool stuff back home that can contribute to our society. Well, for me, I was born and brought up here in Kohima itself, in Officer's Hill. As a kid, we used to play in the streets with everybody else. I studied in measure higher till my 10th. Mm, I was not a very brilliant kid. My memory is, was very poor. And our education system is such that uh, it, it relies heavily on memory power. Until today, I have very bad memory. If you tell me something right now, after five minutes, I'll forget again. So my score in school was like very mediocre, right in the middle. But I was always a hustler, uh, always jobber justy. I always used to, <laughs> even if I could not, even if, if I was not eligible, or even if people tell me that ah, this is not for you, you are not capable of doing this, I would always think, I would always give it a try. Only if you give it a try, you know whether you will succeed or fail. So uh, even if people tell me you will fail, I'll first try and fail then, oh yeah, I'll fail. Uh, that is my approach normally. After science college, I gave my joint entrance exam. Uh, I wanted to be, I, want, I, I selected electronics engineer. During that time, <clears throat> 
whenever, I, and I never thought about the future, what the prospects of electronic engineer will be, like most of us. We just pass our class 10, then our class 12, ah, key grow next, ah, chol, BA pro, BA pro, after that, what next? Ah, MA pro, MA pro. So I was this, <laughs> I belong to the generation where we just go with the flow. Electronics engineering, I just take, I thought it's cool. So I got selected in the electronics engineering thing and I went to Mumbai. I got selected in one engineering college in Mumbai. I went there and during the first semester, I fail, failed in all subjects, five subjects. Uh, I, I don't know, I studied really hard, but I failed. So I was like feeling very super dejected, but I said like, no, I should give more effort. And then there was this super tough, maths is always something which always comes back and tortures me. So again, I failed in something called maths too. But in engineering, we have something called KT, like back paper. So even if you have back, back paper, you can still proceed in your engineering. Mm, so I used to take tuitions. I decided to take tuitions again because of maths. Maths has been haunting me since class eight. I used to wake up at around 4.30 and take this train from Vashi, there was a station, to this place called Nehru. There was a good tuition center. I took tuitions there, I gave more effort, and yeah. And then after the tuitions in the morning, I used to go back to college. And after college, again, the whole routine. It was tough, Mumbai, because it was super hot. And in the train, if you see, if you YouTube and look at all the videos of Mumbai local train, people have a hard time. You hardly have place to sit. You're crammed inside the chain and it's super hot, but it was fun. Uh, so I ultimately managed to pass my maths too also. And I really struggled through my engineering to somehow crack my engineering degree. Mm, most of it, what I studied in my engineering degree, to be very frank, I, I don't know if it has really added any value or I remember what I studied. I think we studied mostly just to get the certificate. But then the interesting part started. As soon as I graduated, most of my friends, they decided to come back home to Nagaland, mostly because of parental pressure. They wanted to come and give UPSC, NPSC, appear for government jobs and all that. But I decided, hey, I think I should stay back in the city and just experience how these people in the city, they, they, you know, set up all these businesses, have all these multinational corporations like Microsoft, Dell, or all these companies, great, great companies, they come and set up and create so many jobs and they have like multi-billion dollar revenue. I just, I was kind of interested in that, so I thought I'll give it a try. But it was around 2009, I think. Earlier to 2009, I was just loitering around. Like most of, most of us people in uh, our youth also sometimes they say after they graduate, you must be in the same position as I was back then. After you graduate, you're clueless. Kikura said, I cook run and go to said, maybe I'll give you NPSC, maybe I'll do that. No harm, even if you are in that position, you just keep moving forward. Because I have been there, so many of us have been there, clueless, don't know what to do in life. But you should always go and look for opportunity. You should not wait for opportunity to come and you know, offer you a plate of opportunities where you just pick and choose. Maybe those people who are really good in studies uh, and they clear those examinations, opportunities will come to them. But for most of us with little <laughs> mediocre academic background and bad memory, we will have to go and hustle. Hustling is extremely important. We have to go and look for opportunities. So I guess that's what I did. I decided to go and stay with my cousin, uh, Viket. He was in Pune, they were doing his graduation there. So I went and stayed there in a room, like I think like six of us used to sleep together, like all mattress, but Pune was so much fun. I think so many members of UBC and all these people, all my friends were Mele and all these guys from UBC, they were back in Pune during that time. They were my neighbors. Um, they were all studying, some of them were working. I decided to go there and look for a job. But it was during a time at the global, at the peak of the global recession, financial crisis. People were getting kicked out of their jobs and I was there looking for a job in a corporate sector, in a private sector. Uh, I used to look for newspaper advertisements in my cousin's house and then I used to take the bus and go sit for interviews. I did not go get through one or two interviews, but those failures, it helped me improve on how I should prepare for interviews. So always go and sit for interviews. Even if you don't get selected, don't consider it as a failure. Consider it as a learn something, you learn something so that you can improve yourself. So I learned how to, you know, maybe make my posture more confident, improve the way I deliver, the way I speak. Because as a kid, I remember 
And let me take, pause here and take you back to the time in Science College. I always wanted to speak in public, but I used to tremble like anything. My hands used to shake. Even if I'm holding a paper, it used to shake. Uh, there was an extempore speech competition. And then I decided to take part. I went up on stage and I made a big fool of myself. That was the first time I heard my voice in the speaker and it sounded very funny. <laughs> but uh, I thought like I can never speak in public. But the more I started standing up on stage and started speaking, the speaking, the stage fright just went away. Now I can be confident enough to just go and make a fool out of myself and entertain people on stage by beatboxing or singing or just talking for one hour continuously. Uh, so yeah, always face your fears. That's what I want to say here is like, if you are afraid of something, just face it. Uh, because ultimately you can, uh, you can, you can garner that strength out of your fear or you can convert your fear into your strength is what I wanted to say uh, and really take advantage of it. <clears throat> that is the second thing I want to point out here. So again, going back to Pune, I said for many, in many interviews, I finally got uh, uh, in one interview, but I, I went for one interview for one job in this company called eClerks. Uh, they were working for a multinational company called Dell, Dell Computers, the computers we use. I really wanted to work in that company. I thought I'll learn something about software, about the technology. Uh, there was a huge queue, lots of old people were also coming and giving interview. I think because they were kicked out of their jobs and then they had to look for a new job. And I was competing with all of them. After three rounds of interview, I got selected and they offered me a salary of 11,500. And I said like, in Pune, I have to pay my house rent, I have to pay for my uh, food, for my transportation and everything. I don't think I can survive with 11,500. I bargained and I think they gave me 13,000. That was my first job. Let me pause here and again ask the youths. Like most of us in our first job, we always ask for salary kiman po. Uh, later on I realized the first job we ever do, I think the salary is not important at all, but the knowledge we gain and the things we learn from the first job because that is the springboard that is the platform we get in life that is going to propel you into greater heights so i just thought like okay it doesn't matter the salary i'll just maybe i'll learn something cool so i went for the job i took it the job was i don't know it was horrible in a way because we had to work from 1 p.m to 12 a.m we had to work with americans like how people work in a call center but i was not in a call center but because my client the dell computers was head headquartered in u.s we had to in, uh, constantly be in touch with the client. My job was very boring in the first job. I thought I'll do something, some computer programming, but my first job was they made me as a data entry operator. <laughs> so Dell computers, they used to receive orders from all around the world. I had to sit there and type it in Excel. I, I told my boss, sir, this is a boring job. I want to learn computer programming. There was this group of people who were sitting near our thing and they were doing very cool computer programming automation and all that. So after my job, after my work timing at 12 a.m. midnight was over, I decided to let my transport go and sit with this guy. His name was Kumar, he was really good. And I decided to sit extra hours with him. And we did computer programming, I learned everything. Within, within three months, I joined this group. And our team was called Lead Generation Team. We generate leads for this company called Dell. And it grew from two to three people to about 30 to 40 people, the business grew. And Dell also recognized us and gave us some recognition award and whatnot. Uh, so that was my experience in the corporate sector from data entry operator. I gave extra hours uh, uh, at around midnight till 2 a.m. We used to sit and we used to learn. And I became kind of good in the basic programming at least, computer programming. That, is what, that was how I got introduced into programming. It was not what I studied in engineering, but because what I learned after I actually uh, on ground using my hands-on experience. That is when I started learning that, hey, I think we learn more by using our hands and actually creating something and working rather than only reading books. Books is important, it gives us knowledge and information. But more important than books is actually applying what you learn in the books in practical. That is when you get real knowledge. After eClerks, uh, I joined another company, Ventura, and then after that, uh, I helped uh, I started doing some startups. During that time, I was really interested in social networking. My friend Tali, he's now in the US, he's working there. Uh, he introduced me to Facebook around 2007, eight, I think. 
And then that time uh, in Kohima with our parents, we used to always discuss about how bad the roads in Kohima are, how much corruption is there, and all those things that all of us rant about. But there was not a common platform for us to come together and really share our ideas, concern about our society, and how to improve it. And it was in the kitchen I was discussing with my parents, and just like the fire in the kitchen and the smoke going up the chimney, our discussions were just going up in smokes. It's useless. So we decided to form a Facebook group called the Naga Blog. Uh, initially, it was just few of us, and later on, more and more people joined. Uh, it's been about, I guess, more than 10 years now that the group is running. We have a decent number, and now so many similar other Facebook groups have come up. And that was a small spark where we thought like we can really contribute something to our society because that was the first time people started raising their voice on social media. That social media was something which was very alien to our society during that time. And around 2012 or 2013, we decided, I guess it was during that time, we decided to have some fun. We said, like, let's try and experiment something. Let's do something called mission potholes. There are so many potholes in Nagaland, especially in our capital, Kohima, also during that time, and all over Nagaland. There still is. The roads are still horrible, but we said, like, let's do a protest, but not a violent protest, but a humorous protest. We said, like, people can come up with their fishing rods, rice saplings and plant on the streets and let's demonstrate. Everybody started joining him from all the districts. Some people got actually very creative in Mon and in uh, Temenu area. They even made boats and they, I don't know, that, that was a fun protest. We also came up with all different kinds of initiatives. We promote a lot of entrepreneurs. We promote a lot of successful people through the blog. And that was how I think uh, there was an important transition in our Naga society, wherein we never got to experience television. Uh, we made a direct jump from maybe radio to internet because we being the first or second or third generation in our, uh, among our Nagas, we went straight from wearing rave to necktie. So we always tend to make this jump. I think social, the introduction of social media in our society is very important in terms of building public pressure. Because our culture and our society is different, wherein we don't directly go and argue with a department, hey, kill a rasta banana, do rasta biase. Or like, we, we can't really go and challenge people because in our culture, we maintain some level of courtesy and we are also, we tend to be a bit shy when we want to express verbally. But when it comes to social media, people can really write. And I think that is wonderful. There's also a lot of arguments in social media, which I also learn a lot from other people. There's a lot of arguments between people, but when we meet each other offline, we become friends and we just hang out and we chill. So that's the beauty about social media. The importance is, it is very important to be frank, honest, in expressing our views and opinions because that will ultimately shape and redefine democracy. Social media has kind of transformed democracy from being just, uh, you know, the government using just the traditional media like television, newspaper, instead of being one-way communication, instead of being like uh, uh, communication to the masses, now it has changed to communication from the masses. Even if you see the recent Horn Bill or the SSA or all the important issues in our society, which has to take priority over all the other non-priority issues, social media is making all these issues as priority. Now the perspective and thinking of the government and the important leaders of our society is also changing they are able to understand what the people want. Previously, people don't used to express. Now people have become very expressive, sometimes overtly expressive because of social media, but that is a good thing. We should allow, because if you want to write in the newspaper, you need to be very good in English. But on social media, you don't need to be very good in English. Even somebody who is a graduate or somebody who is a dropout, feel free to express your opinions. That is good. And that, is, that always brings about transparency and inclusiveness in our society. That is a story about social media. I got lost there. But yeah, we started this Naga blog and thing. In around 2012, one French ambassador came to Nagaland and he was like, Nagas have so much talent. Do you have an online website? Then we decided, hey, I think that's an idea. Let's make an online website to promote our musicians. That time I did not know how to make a website. So me and my brother, we learned on online how to make a website. Nowadays, everybody knows how to make a website. We have Wix, we have all those easy websites, um, uh, create uh, tools where you can make websites. We just made a website called Indie Hut, zero budget, and we convinced a few of the artists, my friend Alabo and Polarize. 
join the uh, Indie Hut, we'll promote you, we'll share the revenue. We did a, lot, a little bit of business talks. And a lot of artists, they joined during that time. And during that time, I was also very interested in cycling. My friend Lolo, he introduced me to cycling. We went down to Dimapur, we bought some few cycles and we came up and started riding cycles. Then we thought like, when we were riding in Kisama, we thought like, hey, people organize downhill race. Let's do it in Kohima also. Chalo, let's do it. And then we started organizing the downhill mountain bike race called Kohima Downhill, which ultimately became very uh, popular. A lot of uh, cyclists, professional mountain bikers from other states, from other countries also, they came and took part. So Kohima Downhill and now the Mokokchung uh, mountain biking community and now the Nagalin mountain bike, biking community has taken over. And now even Kohima Smart City, they have started ministry interventions have also started about promoting cycling as an alternative means of mobility. But in Kohima, we mostly use it for recreational means. So all these initiatives, uh, we just think like, uh, whenever an idea comes to mind, we get hundreds of ideas. But sometimes it is difficult to turn an idea into a plan and a plan to execute the plan. But sometimes you just have to say, if it's not gonna cost a lot of money, you should just say, chalo, let's do it and always do it. Uh, we also do that street fitness. That also with my friend Hukupa, we said like, one day we were doing push-ups in his house and we said like, hey, what if we do some push-up competition in Raj Bhavan and we call people? You have social media, you don't have to spend any money. We invited so many people come, even from Dimapur and everyone. So street fitness also became a popular uh, culture. Uh, we started that around 2014 and many, many people started coming in and now so many people are into fitness and we lo always look forward to that street fitness event every year. So, I mean, my point is, for us, we should not hold back if you have an idea. If you're not gonna invest and risk a lot of amount of money, if the risk of investment, the investment amount is small, you should always go ahead and just try anything. Even if it fails, it's okay. For me, I try 10 things, one succeeds, but I always write, write about the one thing that succeeds. I don't write about the failures, I learn from it. So you should always try, go ahead and try. And yeah, so parallelly while I was working in the IT and technology industry, these were some of the parallel activities I was doing with my friends. Because of social media, now you, you can really optimize and manage your time efficiently. Because when you're working on a project, uh, using email or using WhatsApp or whatever, you can simultaneously handle some other projects. During that time, I was also very interested in business. Uh, so I wrote to some of the very, very big, big companies to come and invest in Koima. Nobody came <laughs> because nobody took me seriously. I even went and visited some wind turbine manufacturing factories. I just made a, I don't know, whatever, very funny visiting card and I told them, uh, this is my company. I want to come and uh, I wish I want to come and see your factory. How you how you make all the solar panels? How you make all those wind turbines? They took me to the factory. Such a nice guy. Back then I was a kid, but they took me seriously and they showed me around the factory. I told them I want to build a dam in Kohima. I want to build I want to install a wind turbine. I want to generate electricity. That time the CEO of the company gave me a very good advice. You start small. If you have like a small river or whatever, you go and try to generate electricity. Start with few kilowatts and expand. So I learned, uh, yeah, we should not think too big. We should learn the basics and start small and then make it grow. We always want to start big. It eventually takes, always takes about 10 to 15 years. We, we tend to give up. We try once, it doesn't work. We try twice, tries four times, five times. It doesn't work out and we give up. But I don't think we should give up. We should try for five, six years. Then maybe it'll work. Back then, I also became a little bit older, I guess. My priorities started to change. I was so interested in entertainment, lifestyle, cycling, having fun. But I don't know whether we choose responsibility or bigger responsibilities choose us. But I had more and more and more, I had to give more of my time to other priority projects. Mm, so I wanted to start business. I wrote to so many businesses, nobody took me seriously. Finally, this company called Westside they had opened in Guwahati. They wanted to open a branch in Nagaland. They re responded to me, but that time I had no money to <laughs> start a business. So I made all the business plans and everything. It was around 2012. Uh, we opened the store only in 2016. The process started around in 2009 when I wrote them an email and they responded back. They had to come and do a market survey of entire Dimapur, Kohima, whatever, and see the market feasibility, viability, and everything. 
whether if you invest a lot of money in such kind of business, whether the returns will be good. Because when it comes to business, you always should always make a profit or else you know you should ultimately close your shop down. So in advance, we have to do all the due diligence of whether the business will actually work. Once they confirmed that, now we had to start a long drawn process. It was a very long drawn process of putting all the things in place, start, starting from the building plans. They even have this architect from Singapore who has to make the design as per the standards and everything. Um, and also getting the investments from all different parties and shareholders. I had no money, so the first thing I went to Entrepreneur Associates, it was around 2013 or 14, I think. And I met Sir Nichute Dulo, and he gave me a very good advice. Mm, first, I will help you with some money, maybe five lakhs or something, or 10 lakhs. But first, you try to raise your money from friends or family. And I was like, why should I go there? You're the one who's giving me, you're the one who's dispersing money. You're the bank, you're the microfinancing, so you should give me money. But he taught me some very important thing, and which I later learned from businesses and businessmen and entrepreneurs who make even millions and millions of dollars. They said, like, the first seed money you ever raise is either you invest your own savings or you go and beg your friends and family, FNR. So, in the first place, banking or lending money is all about trust. If I don't trust you, or if you don't trust me, and I come and ask you for 10,000, will you lend me money? I don't think so. Only if you trust me and you know that you, are, you have that trust and you know that I, this guy guaranteed he will pay me back, then only you lend money, right? So similarly, banks or financial institutions or individuals or investors or venture capitalists or angel investors, they all work in the same way. First, you have to earn the trust. So the f if your friends and family don't even trust you, how will a bank trust you? That was the first step. So if you want to start something, a business, start small, start with a budget of maybe one or two lakhs, try to raise 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 from here and there. That's what I exactly did. I went to my friends and family, my uncles and aunties. I showed them the plans. Sometimes I even make a PowerPoint presentation. I tell them this is going to be a profitable business. I show them all the calculation. This is the capex, the capital expenditure. Uh, we are going to spend uh, this amount of money on tiles, this amount of money in the electrical workings, uh, in the furnitures, in hiring the employees. So the total capital expenditure will be, say, for example, 10 lakhs. And for every month, I'm going to spend about, say, four, uh, 2 lakhs in paying the empo employee salaries. So the expenditure every month, say, example, is 2 lakhs. I need to generate more than that, right, to make my business profitable. So I have to guarantee that my stock value is this much. This is the kind of replenish, replen replenishment of the stocks I'm going to do every month. And this is the market potential. Every month, my business is going to generate, say, about 15, 20 lakhs. So I have a profit of 10 lakhs. And with a profit of 10 lakhs, every month I'm going to pay you one lakh. So only if I'm able to convince somebody with a very good presentation, solid with facts and figures, then you will get your first seed money. Your first pitching to get a seed money is always that. Even if it's your parents, you practice that. Because your business plan has to be solid. So that is how you get your seed money from investors, friends, and family. The bank will never ever loan you money until you are a proven businessman. So you open a current bank account. Then you start, you know, good transaction in your current bank account and you show the bank, I'm a good businessman. Then the bank, without you even asking, the bank will say, hey, here's a loan of 15 lakhs, 20 lakhs, 50 lakhs. Please use it and expand. Because only if, you, as a businessman, uh, the main fundamental principle of being a good businessman is knowing the science and the art of multiplying money. Uh, similar to that parable in the Bible, which you know, has different connotations, but for me, it's just my under, uh, you know, humble understanding of this. And I, would like, I often like to take example of this, is that the servant gave this talent. Ta talent in the Bible is like, uh, in those olden times, during the Roman times, uh, during, during the biblical times, it was, the, it was money, it was money. So the master gives three servants different amount of talents based on their capability. The first servant multiplies it, second servant multiplies it, the third servant, he doesn't multiply it, but keep it hidden. Uh, so the master rewards the first two servants and punishes the third servant. So I think that is also, we, I, I hope that I'm right, when I say like we can take example from that, also in terms of when we should learn how to use our talents. Everybody is gifted in different, different ways. Some people are good in videography, some people are good in writing articles, some people are good in speaking. So God has blessed us with different, 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 different capabilities. 
we should understand our strength and our capabilities and try to harness that and you know empower yourself each and every time you go and utilize that talent and multiply it for blessing people around you so that is what we should do similarly when it comes to investment and business also so after setting up the business that business is now doing good till now and we have about uh, 45 to 50 employees you know floating uh, permanent staff is about 40 to 45 um, so we are also able to create livelihood and jobs employment opportunities for our youths I think that is very important especially when it comes to Naga society and looking at ourselves back then I did not want to rely on the government instead of depending on the government you should make the government depend on you how as a business the more businesses strive, the more industries strive, the more people get wealthy, the government also gets wealthy. And if the government gets wealthy, that wealth in the government treasury should be used for development. There's a connection between all this. I'm not able to explain where's the head, where's the tail, but I hope you get the point. As a business, for example, if I'm generating, say, one crore in a year, I pay tax of 18%, that is 18 lakhs to the government treasury. Next year, I make, say, 10 crores. That next year I pay a tax of say 1.1 crore 80 lakhs to the government. See, as my business grew, the government tre treasury also grew. Because of GST, we pay tax to the government. We Nagas, we don't pay income tax if we are in the tribal belt in Nagaland. But at least if you are a businessman, if you are running a business, you pay tax to the government. Where do we think government gets money from? It is may majority income for the government is always through taxes. Taxes paid by the business. And this has been in practice for thousands of years, right? Since the times of the kings and queens they collect tax from there uh, uh, from the kingdom from those people in the kingdom and they send the merchants out they bring wealth back and they grow their kingdom so similarly government functions in the same way only but in different terms now they have all these economic terms like GST taxes excise tax income tax and all the indirect taxes but basically is that government gets money from who the businessmen and the citizens so the wealthier the citizens and the businesses get the government also gets wealthy. The bigger the businesses grow, the more jobs the businesses create. So ultimately, jobs are not supposed to be created by government. Jobs are supposed to be created by businesses. That is a fundamental thing which I think our society needs to understand. We need to promote businesses. We need to, but in order to promote business, you need to improve the ease of doing business. We need to create awareness among the entrepreneurs how to get seed money. We need to pro promote, uh, we need to really uh, uh, encourage more and more youngsters into uh, the art and the science of how to set up a business, how to run profitable business, more importantly, profitable businesses. And just thinking outside the realm of only opening a cafe, but maybe venturing out into other more lucrative uh, sectors as well. Here in Nagaland, once all the political issues are settled, it's gonna really boom. Because after Guwahati, after Assam, I've been to Mizoram, I've been to Tripura, I interacted with the tribals uh, in Tripura, I went to Gangtok and all these places, but really Naglen is very special because here it's very vibrant. People are restless, they really want to do something. But there are some issues like, especially the priority of the government needs to focus on creating the core infrastructures like good roads, electricity, good internet. This is all we need. The government needs to focus on these priorities. The entrepreneurs will do the rest and we can bring investment from outside. Some of the land laws need to be uh, made more progressive. And also some of the uh, traditional or like the older uh, regressive policies that we have need to make more progressive. Then in that ways we can bring investors from outside. We can become like South Korea, Singapore. Why not? Why not? I say why not? We can definitely become uh, a very progressive and prosperous state in the years to come if we all work together. Because especially after that, after I was working in Pune, I got this opportunity with this Accenture, a uh, company called Accenture. It's a, US com it, it's a US company. They were working with governments. Uh, we were, they were the first to make some e-governance solutions using technology for government. It was, when, it was during the initial days of the Digital India program. Because to go digital is very important for a government. When you look at the most transparent, corruption-free countries, from Singapore to Estonia to South Korea to all these countries which are very progressive Japan India is striving towards that and even Nagaland should be the first to reach that 
we need, in order for us, Nagaland, we say like we should be corruption free. Means, in another sense, we should have transparency. But how do we, how do we uh, enforce or mandate transparency? It is only tr if we are able to go digital, if everything is transparent, if and more efficient, if we are able to stop working in paper files, which takes months and months to process, something which can be done in an email in five minutes, sometimes even takes five months in the government. So those are the small, 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 different, different elements are all combined, which is really taking us backward. So there are some key interventions, the core infrastructures like good roads, electricity, good internet, uh, ease of doing business, and also making the government digital will just transform Nagaland and be able to empower all our entrepreneurs to go forward. So government also has an extremely role to play, but in addition, we, the young people, the entrepreneurs, we also have an extremely ro important role to play to start thinking outside of the government. Go outside, be an explorer, go work in the private sector for a few years. You will learn so much that you will be able to handle any big business which comes to Nagaland and you will be able to set it up. Example, you will be able to bring big corporations. When the uh, power and the internet uh, and everything improves, and maybe you can set up a big call center or BPO in Dimapur. India is going to lose up to $30 billion to Philippines. Why? Because all the call centers, especially the voice processes, are going to Philippines to Mani uh, Manila. Because the reasons why all these call centers are moving to Philippines is because of one reason, which the Association of Chambers of Commerce and Industry, the central body, they gave one key reason, they said like, Filipinos, they have a closer affinity to English language and their culture and the Western culture. And it made me realize, I, we Nagas are also like that. Our English is old, accent is also a little bit neutral. We also speak a little bit like the Filipinos, even if we are singing like we're, <laughs> speaking like we're singing. But we have a closer affinity to Western culture. $30 billion industry, that is like how many times the size of our state revenue. That can be brought back to India, that can be brought back to Nagaland. We have to think in those terms. Forget about only building a retaining wall or building drainage or having a jubilee or fed day. Now we should really start thinking big because our time is coming very soon for us, Nagas, to be an example for the rest of the country. Nagaland is where the plains of India stops and the mountains towards Southeast Asia starts. We are the gateway between the two largest economies in the world now. Southeast Asia, Vietnam is like booming. All the companies from China are now moving to Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Southeast Asia is gonna boom. India is booming, it's becoming a superpower. We are right in the middle and we are still in the same state where if we look around us, things have hardly changed besides some of the roads being repaired. But Nagaland is not just Kohima and Dimapur. The rest of Nagaland should grow equally. But how do we make that happen? Only if our leaders, not just the political leaders, not just the ho ho or the tribal leaders, but even the youth leaders, you really need to give, you really need to push, you really need, you really need to be jobodjusti sometimes. And maybe sometimes you even need to <laughs> compromise yourself and get into an argument. But if it is for good, go for it and fight for what is right. Because once we get old, we will regret and we'll say, ah, oh, we were not able to do this in our lifetime. Why did I not try? Why did I not say when I had the chance? So when you have the chance, when you are young, when you are energetic, just go for it. Push for change, ask for it. We people, we don't go and ask for the government, hey, show me the plan for the road. How is this? How are you designing the smart city? Show me the plan for your walkable. How are you designing? I mean, we should go and ask. You have every right to demand. You should come and demand from us also. Show me your plan. How much money have you utilized? How much the central government has sent you? How much has the taxpayer sent? Not only to the uh, our present government, but even all the other elements who are collecting tax from the public, we should actually go and ask. You're collecting tax from public? How are you utilizing it for the public? We should be bold. We Nagas are called warriors. We are supposed to be bold. So we should always challenge people in authority. We should always challenge ourselves also to improve and become better. Ultimately, I also got the chance to work with the government of Uttarakhand and Goa. When I was working with this company called EY Ernst and Young, they are one of the leading consulting companies in the world. So I was working as a senior government consultant where I was working on reforms on the ease of doing business and with the Investment Promotion Board of Goa. Our, I designed the architecture, the main key solution of the uh, Goa Investment Promotion Board single window system where investors can just apply for all their forms, for all their permits, for all their clearances if they want to invest in Goa. 
So that was the thing I designed for the government of Goa, and I was working uh, closely with the Chief Minister's Office of Goa during that time. Uh, the then late Manohar Parikar, very humble, very, very dynamic, and very wise person. I got the chance to uh, uh, sit in a meeting with him two times also for that purpose. And we had to come up with so many laws. We also designed new schemes for their industries, wherein it was very, the way in which the chief minister designed the scheme was very interesting. They said like, if an industry is coming to Goa and they don't have, and our local manpower, they don't have that skill to work in the industry. The industry should pay the local polytechnic colleges to to create certifications in the skill which is required by the industry so that the local peoples will be trained in the skill and get employed in the industry so that we don't have to rely on outside workforce. See, that is the vision we should have for our state. If we say like our local people that we don't have the skill for a certain industry to come because when an industry comes, the first thing they look forward is always skilled manpower. Do you have skilled manpower? Do you have software programmers? Do you have graphic designers? Do you have this? If there's skilled manpower in industry, an investor will always come. So if an industry comes and they don't have skilled manpower, we should, we should tie up with the local universities. We have local polytechnics in Kohima, Atoize, Dimapur, all that places. So you should introduce those certifications and fill the gap so that the skill of the local people, they are upgraded so that they can be employed. Employment generation is extremely important because not everybody can become a businessman or an entrepreneur uh, because it's an extremely risky business and you need a lot of experience. So with that few thoughts, I think I was, I was super random, but uh, while we were praying, I was just praying that just whatever you have to, I was just asking God, whatever you want me to speak, you put those words in my mouth so that maybe it reaches out to whoever is listening and you get out of the super fast talk that I gave, at least you get 1% or 2% of what I get, what I spoke, and you will be able to utilize that little knowledge that I shared with you, and maybe you will be able to utilize it for blessing our society. And lastly, with all those experiences, I still have a long way to go. I'm still hustling, I'm still struggling, uh, but this is a great privilege. I'm very honored and humbled, but I still have a lot to learn, and I'm sure everybody will now start to think beyond just no Offense to our ESC or DSP, they deserve where they are, but think beyond ESC and DSP or just UPSC, there's so much opportunities. And this opportunity is now gonna open up for us here in Northeast and Nagaland. It's gonna open up, it's just gonna come just like that. So those people who have ventured out beyond government, you are going to be the leaders in all these different sectors, starting from say hospitality to different kind of industries that are gonna come because if you have the knowledge, your knowledge will be required. If, you're, if you have the skill, your skill will be required. I'm talking about the skill, not the one you read from the book, but the one you got by actually working, by handling the camera, by doing the sound engineering, by designing something, by cutting a wood and making a, a nice furniture out of it. That is the kind of skill and experience I'm talking about. Books are good. It's extremely important if you want to give exams. But simultaneously, it's very important for us to be business-minded, not in a bad way, but in a good way, because we need to know how to handle money, and also we need to skill ourselves. It's extremely important for us to be skilled people, not substandard, but set higher standards for everyone. Everybody should set high standards. Don't ever strive for mediocrity, always strive for excellency. Be ketchara, people will not like you, but ultimately they'll appreciate you if you're always uh, striving for excellency. Don't ever set, get settled for mediocrity. And lastly, yeah, we should leverage this opportunity for us because Nagaland is the gateway to Southeast Asia. And we are going to be the most important conduit, the middle uh, barrier. And lastly, like Sir Nichito Dulo used to say, we are not a landlocked state, we are a land-linked state. We are gonna link the two great economies in the world. So let's prepare ourselves for that and look forward to wonderful days ahead for all of us. And I once again thank Lighthouse UBC for giving me this opportunity to rant for one hour. Thank you.